John chapter 8, beginning with verse 1, the Bible says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And this phrase, early in the morning, literally, it's before the very dawn of the day. The sun has not come up as of yet when Jesus goes out early in the morning to teach in the temple. The Feast of the Tabernacles, or also called the Feast of Booths, had just completed. And uh, on your outline, the very first point is Christ, the Lord of an immoral woman. The Lord of an immoral woman. And verses 1 to 6, a snare produced. Uh, Dr. Elmer Towns I had him at Liberty University on the course, The Gospel of John, and he wrote this commentary, Gospel of John, Believe and Live. He said, during the Feast of the Tabernacles, the Jewish people erected booths outside the city of Jerusalem and lived in them as a reminder of their pilgrimage and God's provision in the wilderness. This was a time of great celebration in this feast, and they were commemorating, remembering God's faithfulness in providing for them as before they would go into the promised land that God was giving them. And so in the midst of that, so Jesus is now teaching in the temple early morning and the people were coming to Jesus and he sat down and began to teach them. Jesus, as uh, so many of the rabbis would do, would teach being seated as a sign of the authority that Christ has as the teacher. And so he is seated, they are coming, and he began to teach them. Well, in the midst of this teaching, there's quite a crowd of people around Jesus as he is teaching, and the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the center of the court, in the midst of them. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? Notice this was scribes and Pharisees that brought the woman before Jesus. And they were trying to catch Jesus in a trap, we can say. Throughout the scriptures, that never works, does it? They can't trap Jesus. Jesus knows what they're doing. Jesus knows exactly here. And you remember the scribes, not only with the writing, but the teaching the law, being so familiar with what the scripture said. But they only bring the woman that's caught in the midst of adultery in the very act. And now they're trying to get Jesus and saying, Ah, oh, Moses and all commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing Jesus so that they might have grounds for accusing him. That's all they wanted was to try to get Jesus in a trap so they could accuse him. Oh, you know what? If you're, not going, if you're going to let her go, then you're going to violate what Moses said. And if you stone her, you know, say, go ahead and, well, then where's your mercy? Where's your grace? Where's your offer of forgiveness? So they think they have Jesus in this, we could call it a catch-22 in this tough spot, trying to accuse him. They quote the law, but you know, what does the law say? Well, Leviticus 20 says, involved in the scribes know this well, the Pharisees, they quote the law, but they're not following it. They forgot to bring the man who also should have been put to death. They brought the woman that was caught in the midst of adultery, but they didn't bring the man. I think they had planned a, quote, set up to try to, to use this example to try to test Jesus in the midst of this. And they don't bring the man. They don't bring the man involved. But their effort was to try to accuse Jesus. But let's look at verses six to, uh, the latter part of verse 6 to verse 11. A sentence produced. 
But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. We're not told what Jesus writes. I don't believe Jesus was just down there doodling. I think he was writing something very clear to them. It's possible. Maybe he's writing the name of the man that they didn't bring. We don't know. We're not told. But Jesus stooped on the ground and wrote something. And when they persisted in asking him, they keep asking Jesus about this. He straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you. Now this is very important. Spirozodiates in the Lexicoids in the New Testament has a very important note here. The words without sin, the, the, the Greek term that is used here occurs only in verse 7 of John 8, referring to one who was not guilty of the particular sin of which they were accusing the woman whom they had brought to Jesus. Now in the law, it was based upon two or three witnesses. And we know that they would stone to death people. So it can't mean without sin with the idea of not being guilty of sin themselves because every single one of us are guilty of sin. So it's not the matter of not having sin in our lives, not being guilty of a sin. Who could qualify to be that witness to, to step forward to execute? But without sin, Jesus knew these men. Jesus knew what they were trying to do. And he says, okay, the one that is without sin in this particular area that you are accusing her, go ahead, be the first. See, what did Jesus know? He knew, that he knew that every one of those men. He knew every one of those accusers. He knew what they were doing. Jesus said, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground. He's writing on the ground. Whatever he is writing, notice what happens in verse 9. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Now there's still the people that Jesus was teaching. But Jesus alone there with the woman that's been accused. What happened to the accusers? They leave one by one, starting with the oldest. Again, we don't know what Jesus is writing. But there's something here very much so that they are convicted. They are convinced. Some manuscripts include the phrase being convicted by their own conscience. And the verb here used by John literally means to bring the light and expose the convincing. The idea of, of convicting, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, particularly the sin of unbelief and of judgment. And that judgment is really the cross judgment where Satan is judged and of righteousness because Jesus has ascended to the Father. That Jesus said that the Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world. He convicts the lost world. He convinces, brings the light, and exposes I like to compare this. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that the God of this age has blinded their eyes. I like to put it this way. The Holy Spirit takes the blinders off. So the God of this age has blinded the eyes of them that are perishing, but the Holy Spirit takes, removes the blinders, convincing them, makes it clear to light that they are guilty of sin. And it says... That Jesus said to them, when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone with the woman where she was in the center of the court, and straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more.
Dr. Towns wrote again here that John is using a very appropriate verb where he rarely used in the gospel, literally meaning to give judgment against or down on. Stoning as practiced by the Jews involved taking large rocks, raising them over one's head with both hands and then thrusting them down upon the victim. So it'd be casting it down like this, you know, above the head, down onto the victim. And that was the idea of the judgment. And he says, nobody has done that. Where's your accusers? No one's accused you. Neither do I go and sin no more. And the literal rendering of this is, you are sinning, but stop your practice of sin. Stop this ongoing sin. You are indeed, Jesus didn't say she wasn't guilty of the sin. But Jesus made it very clear that as she goes from now on, sin no more in that light. Leave this life or this practice of sin. Let's go to Christ, the light and moral darkness. Begin with verse 12. Jesus is going to re reveal, first of all, himself, the Christ. In light of this, John 8, 12, then again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Remember we said in verse 2, early in the morning Jesus came into the temple. By this time, the sun has risen. The sun is out. And when we think about how important this is, Warren Wiersbe in the Bible Exposition Commentary makes the following comment, perhaps the sun was then appearing so that Jesus was comparing himself to the rising sun. But this would mean he was once again claiming to be God. For to the Jew, the sun was a symbol of Jehovah God. Go to Psalm 84, 11. In Psalm 84, in verse 11. The Bible says, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. In the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, in the fourth chapter, Malachi chapter 4, you read the following. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. The sun of righteousness will rise. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And the Pharisees say to Jesus, you're testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. What are they referring to? There has to be two or three witnesses. We don't accept your testimony, Jesus. We don't accept your claims of who you are saying you are. Do they understand that he has just claimed to be Jehovah? Yes. When he said, I am the light of the world, they understood the claim. They were not believers. They were not believing in him. And they're complaining and they're saying to him, we don't believe you. This is what you're saying about yourself. And Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. Now they're really going to get excited, aren't they? The accusers, because what is he saying? My Father who sent me. The very clear claims of deity are here in John 8. 
throughout this whole chapter. My Father who sent me, even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him. Why? This phrase is so important, because his hour had not yet come. We see that would be repeated in the Gospel of John. They didn't take him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. But remember, Jesus would say, my hour has come. Time to go to the cross. Time to go and die on the cross. Time to be turned over as the Jewish leaders. And, 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 and then I would be turned, they would be turned over to the Romans. And they would die on the cross. The hour he talked about. But right now... They didn't seize him because, you know, the Lord's still in control over time. They were saying, not during the Passover, lest there be a riot with among all the people. But what was God's timetable? Not according to what man said. Man was saying, not during this feast, not, not right now. But no, God was in control. And it wasn't by accident. As they would be killing the Passover lambs, their Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, would be dying on the cross for our sins. And that veil in the temple would be torn from top to bottom. Access to God through Jesus Christ, the Son. Jesus offered the two witnesses his own witness and the witness of his Father who sent him. But now he's going to reveal the Father, verses 21 through 27. Then Jesus said again to them, I go away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Notice the singular here, that you will die in your sin, the sin principle or the very sin nature in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. What's their thinking? Surely he's not going to go out and kill himself because we couldn't go there. They are completely blinded to the truth. Jesus was saying to them, you are from below, I'm from above. You are of this world I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins, plural. Now, the first sin, what happened when Adam sinned? Romans 5, 12, all sinned and death spread to all men because all sinned, separate from God. What condition are we born in? Sin nature. We have the sin nature. Every single one that was born. When we raised, you know, when you think about with kids, you never had to teach your kids to look at you and say no. Or you didn't have to teach your kids how to lie. Or say, I didn't do it. He did or she did. But that took place, didn't it? The sin nature. We are born with a need. And Jesus is trying to express to them, you have a need. But because you do not believe, unless you believe that I am. Now notice in verse 24, that is another very clear Jehovah statement claim. It's a very, claim, uh, very clear statement of deity. Unless you believe that I am, in our Bibles, he has been added, it's italicized. It's, it doesn't really help with the understanding in this instance. Literally, it's I am. It's the name of the Lord. 
You don't believe that I am. And so you will die in your sins. So they were saying to him, who are you? Are they missing this completely? What's Jesus been saying over and over to them? I came from the Father. I am the I am. They studied the Old Testament scriptures. They're saying that he's claiming the name of the Lord, all capital letters, Jehovah, the great I am. Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize he had been speaking to them about the Father. Risby notes again that Jesus boldly made several claims to deity. He said he would judge, and judgment to the Jews belonged only to God. He claimed to be sent by God, and he claimed to have heard from God the things that he taught. He was making it very clear who he is. But notice the final revelation by revealing the cross. And Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, we've seen this before, about Jesus being lifted up. Remember in John 3, 4, uh, John 314 that even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness remember the fiery serpents and how they were bitten and and the only way that they could live and when God told Moses to put the, the serpent up onto the pole make a bronze serpent and if they would look and live then they would they would see that the idea is they had to look up and live they had to look to that that serpent in order to live and even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. They must believe in Jesus Christ. They must come to the point to believe in Him. He reveals the cross. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. Notice how many times we keep saying I am here in John 8. Again, he has been italicized. It's been added. We can say it's not there. It's not part of the original scriptures. But you will know that I am. Another Jehovah statement. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. I came to do the will of the Father, and he is always pleased. And we would see the Father would say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Remember at the baptism? We hear that, and then later on in the Gospel of John, we hear that he says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Notice the last verse of verse 30 here. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. We mentioned that the word believe is used by John 98 times in this gospel. 98 times the word believe is used. The preposition eis, E-I-S in the Greek is in, into, or on. And so it is the object of belief, this is very important, believing in Jesus Christ, to believe in Him. That means salvation for those that believe in Jesus Christ. Now Jesus later on, and, and later on in this passage in John 8, He'll talk about those that believed Him, but the preposition ice is left out because that wasn't necessarily coming to Him for salvation. They might have been saying, oh, we, we've seen his miracles and there's interest here and some of them would fall away. They really were not true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said the true disciples are going to continue in my word. They would be following me. 
But there were those among this large group and this multitude, you would have those that were fascinated with Jesus, but were not believing in him. They were not trusting him for salvation. But here in verse 30, as Jesus spoke these things, many came to believe in him. There's a large crowd that he's teaching in the temple. Remember his teaching. They saw how he handled the scribes and the Pharisees and what they tried to do to Jesus. And when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, that statement of the, the connection probably with the sun coming up, we don't know for sure, but probably it would be the idea of Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. And the one who would believe in me to walk in the light. John 1, 5 would say the similar thing. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5 would say that God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. We see John using that a lot. In the very first chapter, I believe, well, maybe it's verse 4, that he is the light. In him is life of men. So Jesus using the I am the light of the world and more of darkness. Take your Bibles and go over to Acts chapter 2. Some of those that were involved in the crowd that would cry, crucify him, crucify him. We don't know how many of them, but there would be those that were calling for the crucifixion of Jesus that would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? It was an answer to prayer. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. With that, and that was in the imperfect tense, and it was the idea, so he repeated that. Probably with each time of the nails going in, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Made it possible for them to come to know Jesus Christ. And answer to the prayer. Acts chapter 2. I want you to see, beginning in verse 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. Again, this is one of the three major feasts. This is the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. So there's a, a, a lot of Jews that are coming back from wherever to Jerusalem in obedience to the Word of God. And they are there. And Peter is saying, You who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now what is going to happen at the second coming of Christ, verses 19 through 21, and I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. You see in verse 23, God's eternal plan of salvation, the reality that he would send his son, Jesus Christ, the predetermined plan, but yet personal responsibility. Notice this in verse 23. You nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he's at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. 
Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch Dave, David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath poured forth this which you both see and hear, for it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So the, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. What happened? Conviction. Conviction causing them to see, causing them to see their need for the Savior, causing them to see what they have been involved, their unbelief. They were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? So many of them that were hearing Jesus believed in him. There were many that were even cried out, crucify him, that didn't believe. And now in Acts 2, have come to know the Savior, have believed. Peter said to them, I'm going to give it the literal rendering in verse 38, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ as a result of the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls. And you know what's fascinating? They were Jews. They were Jews. They had come to know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. They had believed in him. They had life. The early church begins. You see that running total in the early books of uh, early chapters of Acts. In Acts 4, it comes up to 5,000 were believing. 5,000. Every time that they would come to know Christ, that prayer, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing, was being answered. That they were receiving Christ as the Lord and Savior. The great I am, the light of the world in moral darkness. So here we see the Jews believed in him many of them that listened had come to the point they repented they had a change of thinking concerning Jesus they had a change of thinking on the day of Pentecost there were many multitudes 3,000 that had a change of thinking about Jesus who he is what he came to do he's the Savior what a wonderful Savior is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What a wonderful Savior. Heavenly Father, as the scribes and the Pharisees had set up this attempted trap of Jesus, Lord, we're not told what Jesus wrote on the ground. But as Jesus looked up 
and all of the accusers from the oldest to the youngest left. And as the unbelieving Jews said, where did you come from? Jesus had been telling them, my father sent me. And it was very clear, Jesus claims to deity in John chapter 8. Oh, but we rejoice in verse 30 where it said that many that were listening to Jesus, many of them believed in him. Your word said, Lord, that even though you came to your own and they received you not, as many as received you, to them you gave the right to be called the children of God, to those that believe on your name. In the matter of days later, after the cross, after the resurrection, after the ascension, when it was another feast, the Feast of Weeks, the Pentecost being fulfilled, as the Holy Spirit would come to indwell, we see the truth again. As Peter clearly presented the gospel, many were cut to the heart and said, what shall we do? Repent. There had to be a change of their thinking concerning Jesus and thinking that they had a righteousness on their own by trying to keep the law to knowing that they could not achieve eternal life by their works, by their own righteousness. But they turned to you, Lord. Help us as we leave here tonight that we would just remember and see as what Jesus said very clearly. As Jesus said, I am the great I am. Later on, he would even tell these unbelieving Jews before Abraham was, I am. The claims to deity are very clear. And we thank you that we have the scriptures that we can study and see how Jesus, the light of the world, help us as we leave here tonight. Lord, that we may be faithful witnesses unto you. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.